So this is the next video in the series about uh, ARM v7 programming, uh, the instruction set architecture and the way to write code in it for uh, low level embedded machines like ARM chips. Um, and this one we're going to talk about the programmer model, which is what you as a programmer have access to in terms of memory systems. Um, specifically registers for accessing memory, registers for storing and retrieving information, registers for doing your, your math, and, and what those registers mean in terms of access to uh, pointers and structures and all this kind of stuff. So um, the ARM model is actually a little simpler than the MIPS model. MIPS, if you recall, or if you've looked at it, has 32 registers uh, that the programmer can access. ARM only has 16. And these kind of design decisions are based on how much of the instruction you want to take up with specifying registers. Uh, the instructions are three operand instructions, which means you specify two sources and a destination, uh, which means in MIPS, with 32 registers in the register file, that means you had 5, 10, 15 bits just to specify the source and the destination of your instruction, right? Because every register has to pick one of 32 you need five bits to pick one of 32 numbers. That means five bits for the first source, five bits for the second source, and five bits for the destination. That's half the instruction, essentially, just on selecting registers. So ARM goes a different direction. ARM says we need lots of registers, right? We're not going to just have four registers, uh, like x86 has A, B, I, and D, and that's it and a bunch of other stuff, but it's, it's, it's super simple. What ARM does is compromises between these two approaches, and it says we're going to have 16 registers, which is not a ton, right? 16 is a small number, um, but it means that we only need 12 bits to specify two sources and a destination. And as you'll see, there are other things we specify when we, when we specify the operands for our instructions. But these are the 16 registers, and all of the registers are in here, right? The program counter is one of these registers. That means that we can mess around with the program counter if we want to. We shouldn't. We should be careful, just like in MIPS, but we can, right? We have the link register, which in MIPS was the return address. So the link register contains the address of the calling function so that you can get back where you started when you do a subroutine. Uh, we have the stack pointer, just one stack pointer, just one stack, right? And each each context, right, each scope of each function will have a different place in the stack where it's doing stuff because of the way that the subroutines get called, but it's a single stack pointer for each system. And then we have um, V registers and A registers. A, 1 through 4 are our return address, our return value registers, and V, uh, 1 through 8, are our argument registers. Um, oh, no, I did that wrong. Four arguments and eight variables. So arguments and variables. Um, and just like in MIPS, arguments and variables, depending on whether the subroutine is responsible for storing or not storing, right? So arguments are allowed to change within a subroutine, right? If you send a function a value and you expect that value to change, that's an argument. Variables are expected not to change in a subroutine. If you send a value and it shouldn't change, uh, then, which is weird to call it, a variable should not change. But within the context of a function, a variable, a vregister, should not change. Uh, and so you send it a value, and if you want the, if you want to use a vregister within the context of your uh, subroutine, then you need to pop it on the stack before you mess around with it. So arguments are allowed to change within the subroutine. Variables should be retained. Now, when you start writing code, you're only going to be in the context of one function anyway, so it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever the heck you want. Um, but this is a limited number of variables, right? A limited number of registers, which means you have to be a little bit careful um, designing your algorithms to decide w how you're going to allocate space. So four arguments, whoops, four arguments, register zero through three, and then eight variables, registers four through 11. And then in addition, V6, seven, and eight are also called uh, stack base, stack limit, and frame pointer. Now, we're not going to use stack base and stack limit, but those are going to be useful if you want to set up a special stack with a certain size. The base and the limit then are places where you can decide, you know, how much your stack is so that you can detect whether you're getting close to stack overflow or not. Uh, and then the frame pointer, uh, as we talked about in MIPS, um, the frame pointer points to the sort of local reference for local variables and return values and stuff within the context of a function. And then when you call the function again and you establish a new stack frame, that'll have a new frame pointer. So stack pointer is universal. Frame pointer goes function by function. 
Uh, that's the register file. And this is really, really important to recognize uh, and to be a little bit scared of and careful of is that the program counter is a general purpose register that you as a programmer have access to. Now, what we'll find in, um, in real world scenarios is that any program trying to access the program counter, the operating system is gonna go, actually, no, we're gonna do something different instead. But theoretically, the program counter is a general purpose register, which is very powerful, but it can get you into a lot of trouble. So be a little bit careful. The register file, as we'll see, is actually significantly more complicated than this, but for a single program running in a single context, that's what it looks like. Uh, in fact, there are um, several copies of the register file for different contexts, which we'll get to later on. Uh, and what we find in general with ARMv7 is there is a straightforward case and then a more complicated case um, for special purpose. And this is going to be the case for most of what we do in ARM. Um, when we do data processing instructions, there's going to be a super simple version and then some really complicated stuff for special purposes. And it's why I think ARM v7 specifically is a really interesting compromise in design because it tries to do stuff in a way that's easy to understand, but also is still powerful enough to do all of the things that you need to do. ARM also has condition codes. Now this is different from MIPS, uh, and this is a more common uh, structure in more traditional programming languages like x86. A condition code register the idea here is it's going to keep information about what happened in the previous instruction. So, for example, you subtract two numbers, one from the next. That result could be negative, it could be zero, uh, and it could be, there could be other stuff going on, right? If you maintain that information, right, was it negative, was it zero, was there a carry, was there an overflow, if you maintain that information somewhere outside of the register file, then when you do the next instruction, you can base whether or not you do it or how you do it based on the outcome of the previous instruction. So you can compare two numbers and then do something conditionally based on that result. This is how if statements, this is how loops work, right? Um, in MIPS, this stuff is all done internally. There's instructions that will do something based on a comparison. In ARM and other things, you do something in one instruction and then based on the result, you do or don't do the next instruction. Right? So the branching, for example, is all going to be based on a condition code. Branch on a condition code. Right? You're not branching on a comparison. You're not branching on A compared to B. You're branching on a condition code of some kind. Now, there are four condition codes in ARM. Uh, they are N, Z, V, and C. N for negative, Z for zero, C for whether there was a carry out of this process. And that's useful for combining things together. It's useful for doing rotates and, and shifts and a few other things. Uh, and V, an overflow, right, to, to check whether or not the result is uh, trustable or not, right? And if you recall from a previous video, overflow, when you're doing a, a binary add, overflow just says, does the carry out of the last bit match the carry in from the last bit? And if those two match, then chances are you're pretty good. And if those two don't match, then you probably have a problem, right? If you carry in but don't carry out, when that top bit is negative, the result is probably not what you're expecting. So if you need a bit of a refresher on how overflow works, go back and watch my video on overflow. Um, but V for overflow, and we say V for overflow, of course, because if we said O for overflow, it would look like zero and that's confusing. So we use V for overflow because that's somehow less confusing. And we put this in a register called the CPSR, the Current Program Status Register. CPSR is 32 bits. So far we have four bits in it. What's, what else is in there? We'll see. Uh, it gets, there's, there's a lot of really interesting things in there, uh, including the operation mode and a bunch of other stuff. But again, we'll do some more later. So that's the general programming model for ARM. Uh, in the next video, we'll start to look at the three kinds of instructions that you find in ARM.